How's everybody feeling today? Let me say good morning to you and thank you for coming to church. We've had an incredible weekend all week. We've just had great crowds and there's just such a great spirit here today. And how many of you are thankful that God's love never fails? God's love never fails. I, I, did USC win yesterday? I don't, I don't really know. Did they, anybody know? Do we have any USC fans here? Did they win yet? They lost? Who, who beat them? What, what powerhouse of team beat them? Does anybody know? Utah? Okay. Uh, did UCLA win yesterday? Oh, okay. How about the Oklahoma Sooners? Well, that was a game. I saw a picture that reminded me of all of you. I want to show it to you. Here's the, here's the picture. This reminded me of you. Now, you say, well, how does this remind you of the church? Well, because we're all different here today. Would you not agree we're different? We're just different. Secondly, you're kind of dressed up, kind of. But number three, we all get along. Don't you see him getting along in that photograph? We get along. So that reminded me of you. And this just, for me, I'm getting ready to preach, but how many of you, I just want to know, my own poll here, uh, how many of you are cat lovers? You, you love cats. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Come on. Don't be ashamed. I expect all of you to be re-baptized today, okay? Every single cat lover needs to be re-baptized. That's in the book of Leviticus. You can read it. And then just, I just want to know, how many dog lovers do we have in a church? I'm just following the science. That's all I'm doing. Is I'm following the science there. Well, thank you for coming to church. And we are different, but we've come here today to honor the Lord. We just wrapped up a series on the Beatitudes, a seven-week series. And how many of you enjoyed that series? It was so good. And then today, we start a brand new series called One Thing. Everybody say one thing. And um, the idea for this series came from, no one told it to me, I was just reading the Bible, just reading the Bible. And I saw this phrase, it said one thing. And I thought to myself, well, surely I can do just one thing. Whatever this one thing the Bible wants me to do, I can do one thing. How many of you can do one thing? I mean, that's not that hard. But that phrase, more than just a numerical number, it has to do with the, it has to do with importance. This, this thing is the thing that's most important. And then I found that phrase seven different times as I was reading the Bible. I just kept writing it and kept looking at it and studying it. And I, as I got into it, I realized that these, different, these seven different one things, that they were kind of down different, in different areas of life. But all seven were important, and then I thought this is going to be, this would be a great study, a great series. And so the more we studied it, we then decided to write a book, and literally it took a couple of years, several years, to write this book. I, I have a copy of it right here called One Thing. Then after that, we developed some life group curriculum and some life group videos and so today is the day that we begin this series, and I believe that it's going to be a powerful study through the Bible looking at things that the Bible tells us are most important, okay? Are you with me on this? And I have a favor to ask. I don't ask you to do many things, but I've got three things. Number one, I want to encourage you to get involved in a life group. Met a man today, he said he's never been involved in a life group, but he's going to do it. And a life group is where you meet in the week, and there's different times and different places. You can actually host a group yourself if you'd like or attend a group. And it's, it's 5 to 8, 10, 12, 14 people. It's a small group. And you meet every week, and you just go over this material. We give you a little video to watch. You can do it all online if you want, but we give you a list of questions, and you go around and you answer these questions and you take these seven different scriptures that we look, look at and you go down and you dig deep. And uh, I want to encourage you, you can sign up today either in online or you can sign up uh, out in the lobby. And I just want to tell you that, I've told you this before, I don't, 
I, I, I really don't, I don't get a great thrill um, preaching to a large audience. That, that's not why I'm here. I'm here, yes, I want to preach to as many people as possible, but I want to see and know that the people I'm preaching to are plugged into these small life groups where community takes place actually in the church because when you go through a tough time, which you will go through a tough time, that small group, that accountability group, they're the ones that are going to help you get through that tough time. Otherwise, you're going to fall through the cracks and you're going to disappear and no one's even, even going to know you're gone. And so I just want to encourage you uh, these next seven weeks, if you've never been involved in a life group, sign up. Number two on my list, uh, what I'm asking today is for your help. I want you to help encourage others to participate. Today, we decided to do this, and uh, this was at an expense, a great expense. Uh, these books cost $15, and we decided to purchase them, and I, I, and I, sometimes I just feel like as a church, we, give, we do too many things for free. It's like everybody wants something free. We, have, we want our mugs free. We want our T-shirts free, and so we do it. I don't even know. I, sometimes I, I know I'm half crazy, but... I decided let's, let's give a book to every household, one per household, because we want to encourage you to get involved in this study, okay? So we purchased enough that every household can have one. And uh, so don't, after church, when you leave, you'll see people handing these out. We, there, we didn't get enough for everyone in your family. We got enough, uh, we did some math, one per household, okay? Are you with me on this? If you have 50 people living in your house, it's too bad. <laughs> you get one book, and you can share it. Amen. And uh, if you want to purchase other books, or if you want to cover the cost of your book, that's fine. Uh, they'll be available for you to purchase. And I will be signing just because some people like that. And I, I, I hung around last night and today at 9, and I'll do it today. Uh, and I'll sign if you want me to sign your book, and we'll have another night in the future where we'll open up Pillar's Bookstore, and we'll, we'll have the whole evening, and we'll play, have some Christian music playing, and you come drink coffee, and I'll sign your book then too, okay? Or you can just drop it off at the church, and I'll sign it. How's that for a deal? But I need your help. I need your help in posting and encouraging on social media. You can hashtag one thing book and post the pictures uh, of the book. And the, and the most important thing is to pray that in these next seven weeks, and this is what I'm asking for your encouragement, I need your help to pray that over these next seven weeks that there are many, many lives in this city and in this church that will be transformed to the glory of God. And the last thing, my last request, is for you to attend and participate all seven weeks, all right? We're gonna give you this material, uh, ask you to help us uh, get it out to other people, uh, but be here all seven weeks in church and in a life group and see if at the end of these next two months that God doesn't do some amazing things in your life. With that being said, I want you to take your Bibles and turn. Our first message comes from the book of Psalms. So take your Bibles and turn to Psalm chapter 27. Everybody say Psalm. And then in your bulletin, there's a sermon outline. I'd love to have you uh, take that out and take some notes, if you will, today. Uh, each of us here today, and this message, I believe, is so relevant to what's going on in our world today. Uh, we are being led, maybe forced, I don't know, certainly we are told to live in fear. And the only other option other than living in fear is to live a life of faith. There's two ways you can live your life in this world of ours. You can either live being fearful or you can live with your faith in God. You're living right now according to one of those two perspectives. Uh, many of us are living fearfully. You wake up, you scroll the news, it's all bad news. The country seems to be being transformed. Uh, our borders are wide open. We have forced mandates. We have eroding freedoms. We have skyrocketing gas prices. 
We have trillions and trillions of debt. Our culture is no longer a culture that honors God. And as believers, we're becoming the, the world in which we live is becoming more and more hostile to Christianity and all of those things and even more cause those of us who are people of faith to become fearful and you get a point where you just wanna run but you don't know where to run and there's this feeling like I just wanna go up in the hills, get up in the hills and get away from everything that's happening. And David, who wrote the 27th Psalm, we're going to look at Psalm 27, David wrote this. And the person who wrote this, David, as he writes, he's on the run himself. He loves God, he loves the things of God, but he's under attack. And so he flees, and he flees to the hills. He, he, he runs to the hills, and, and he's on the run because King Saul who is literally, literally trying to kill him, his life is being threatened, or he's running or hiding, escaping from one of his other enemies. Either way, David, just like all of us, has to choose, in spite of his circumstances, am I gonna live fearfully or am I gonna live a life of faith? There's an old, old television show called Columbo. Does anybody remember the television show Columbo? Now, if you raise your hand, you're old. But uh, Columbo was one of the first detective shows. Most of the shows on television, the good ones, are detective shows. And uh, so he was one of the first, he was a, uh, a, 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 a kind of a strange guy, but he was always showing up and you, he, he'd just get on your nerves because he would show up unannounced and he would just start asking questions. And it'd just ask you all these questions and it'd, it'd drive you crazy. And then he'd start to leave. Every show was the same. He'd start to leave. And then he'd stop and he'd turn back and he'd say these words. He'd say, hey, just one more thing here, one more thing. How, how many of you remember that show? Well, it leads me to ask each of you, in the midst of our crazy world, with everything that causes you to live in fear, of all the questions that you've ever asked God, and we all ask God questions, but if you could ask God for just one more thing, just one more thing, what would you ask? David, in our text, he asked God for one thing. And as we study Psalm 27, my prayer is that all of us should have such faith as David. Let's begin Roman numeral one in your notes. I only have three major points. David has complete confidence in the Lord. He has complete confidence. Everybody say the word confidence. There comes a point for every one of us when the storms of life come, and they're going to come. When we find ourselves in the midst of a trial, we have to make a decision at that point. Are we going to trust in ourselves? Are we going to put our faith in people, faith in the government? Are we going to put our faith in things, or are we going to put our faith in in God. David, in this psalm, is in the midst of a trial. As bad as any trial that you're going through, he is going through a trial. Death is right around the corner for him. He's, what, he's in what I call a frightening situation. And here's what he says in Psalm 27, verse 1. He says, the Lord, everybody say the Lord, he says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? He says, the Lord is my stronghold. He's the stronghold of my life. Of whom should I be afraid? And then he says in verse 2, and this is what was going on when he wrote this psalm. When evil men advance against me to devour my flesh, and when my enemies and my foes attack me, I'm not the one who's going to stumble and fall. They're the ones who are going to stumble and fall. And then he says in verse 3, though an army, an army, and I'm not talking about a few people, though an entire army besiege me, my heart will not fear. The war break out against, not two nations, though war break out against me, even then, he says, will I be 
confident. Is that a statement or a question? It's a statement. He's saying, even though I'm attacked on every side, my confidence is completely continuing to be in the Lord because I know that the Lord is going to deliver me. I want you to write this down. We need to be trusting in God in the midst of every trial. Whatever the trial, your trust should be in God. Amen? I heard about this woman. She was in, she's from Arkansas. And she was sitting in her car, and she heard this loud bang. It was loud. And then she felt this sharp pain in the back of her head. And she reaches up, and she grabs her head like this. And uh, all kinds of pain. Her car window was down. And somebody walked by and said, are you okay? And she said, I've been shot in the head, and I'm holding my brains in. And she hadn't been shot. What happened was there was a Pillsbury biscuit canister in the back seat. <laughs> and it was really, really hot that day. And the canister exploded and shot the dough to the back of her head, and she's holding on to it. And the point is that sometimes our fears are like that lady's fears. They are unfounded and they're irrational. But sometimes our fears are founded and they are rational. That's just the way it is. But either way, whether your fears are rational or whether your fears are irrational, either way, we should live each day like David with complete confidence in God's ability to see us through any situation. <laughs> Proverbs 3, 5 says to trust in the Lord with all of your heart. And do not lean upon your own understanding. Psalm 118 verse 8 says, It's better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 5 says that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And I know that's not easy all the time. But it's, that's as believers where our faith I mean, as Christians, we're people of faith. So when you're in the midst of that trial, this is where your faith kicks in, to know that God's in control. If you've ever seen a trapeze uh, show, uh, like at a circus, you've got two people and they're swinging on these swings. And one of them's a flyer and one of them's a catcher. One of them, as they're swinging, one of them eventually lets go and they're literally flying through the air. That's the flyer. They both can't let go and catch each other. That doesn't work. One's got to stay on the swing, and one jumps off. He flies off. He arcs his body. He flies through the air. He's going towards the catcher. And at that moment, the flyer only has one responsibility, and that is he's flying through the air. He's supposed to reach out his hands and not move them. He's just supposed to reach out and trust that the catcher is going to pluck him out of the air. And the most dangerous thing the flyer can do as he's flying through the air is try to reach up and grab the catcher. That's not how it works. The flyer flies through the air, extends his hands, and waits and trusts and believes and has confidence that the catcher is going to reach out and save him, grab him, hold on to him. Do you understand that? And that's the exact same thing we're supposed to do anytime we're supposed to go through a trial. You're supposed to reach out your hands to God and believe and trust that he's going to grab a hold of you. That's David. <laughs> David is going through a trial, yet he knows that God's going to protect him. He knows that God's going to deliver him. He knows that he's in a very dangerous and a very fearful situation. He doesn't deny that. He is vulnerable. He understands there's nothing he can do, that a vast army is approaching against him. And so he has no option but to trust fully, putting all his confidence in a God who never fails, and you and I should do the same.
Number two, David was not only confident in the Lord, his confidence was not in himself, but David was consumed. I want you to say the word consumed. David, in the midst of this trial, this storm, he was consumed with the Lord. Now, some of you are consumed with all things concerning the Dodgers. You just are. Or the Lakers. Or food. Anybody consumed with food? Or fashion? Or your house? Or your hobby? Or your hubby? Or your vocation? Or your vacation? The word consume means to be completely absorbed and controlled by one's passion or desire for something or someone. David had such desire, such passion, but his desire was to be in the presence of God. For he says in verse 4, and this is the main point of emphasis in this message, he says, Though I'm pursued by all these enemies, I, I'm putting my trust in God, but there's one thing. Everybody say one thing. There is one thing of all the things that, the, that David could ask. He says, there's one thing I ask of the Lord. This is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord, not one day a week, no, I want to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. To gaze, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. I want you to write this down quickly. He said, I want to dwell in the house of the Lord. I want to behold or look or gaze upon the beauty of the Lord. And I want to inquire in the temple of the Lord. The word dwell means to stay, to remain, to not go anywhere else, to just be in the presence of God. He wants to gaze or behold the beauty of the Lord, which you don't look at God and think about how beautiful he is. What he's saying there is I want to look and think and, 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 and consider all the good that God has done in my life. That's what that phrase means. You're not just looking at God and saying, oh, God's beautiful. No, he, when, he, when he says, I want to look and gaze upon the beauty of the Lord, he's saying, I just want to be in the presence of God, and I want to look and consider all the things, all the good things that God does in my life each and every day. And then he says, I want to inquire of the temple, which means I want to understand what God's will is for me. David was a man after God's own heart. He was a warrior. He was a born leader of men. He was courageous, he was a conqueror, he was a strategist, he was a singer, he was a soldier, he was a worshiper, he was a prince, he was a poet, he was a prophet, but there was one thing he wasn't. By any stretch of the imagination, he wasn't a priest, nor could he ever be a priest. Because privileges, such as being allowed into the inner sanctuaries of the tabernacle, were reserved only for the men that were born in the tribe of Levi to the family of Aaron, not to the men that were born to the tribe of Judah that came from the family of Jesse like David. What David wanted was almost impossible. You have to remember that back in David's day, they did not have what we have today, which is called the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. In order for them to go and be with God, they had to go to the temple. They had to go to the tabernacle because that is where they believed God lived. And this desire that David had to go to the inner sanctuaries of the temple or the tabernacle, that wasn't a passing or trivial thought. It was the daily passion of his heart. He said that I might dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, not just on the Sabbath, not just on special occasions, not just on special holidays, but I want to be there each and every day of my life. 
He also did not attend services in the temple out of a sense of duty. He longed to be in the presence of God because that's where his treasure was. That's, his heart was there also. He had a deliberate passion. He had a daily passion. He had a discerning passion. He wanted to be in the presence of God. He wanted to have an intimate relationship with the Lord and to just catch a glimpse of his beauty to inquire, to seek the Lord, and to stay, and to remain, and to be fully immersed in the presence of God. That is what consumed him. I want to ask you this question. Do you know what God's greatest desire is for you? Do you know what his desire, God's desire, his greatest desire, right? You can just look at it. It's, it's you. You are his greatest desire. God wants to have an intimate relationship with you. But the question is, is he your greatest desire? Now, the Bible tells us that wherever two or three or more are gathered, that God is there. And as I look around, that means that he's here today. Right now, this very moment, God is here. And he's here every time we gather. And the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, that you and I are not supposed to forsake the assembly, which is the church. Now, I know this is not a common or a popular topic in America today. But the word church in the Bible is a Greek word, and the Greek word is the word ekklesia. The word ekklesia in the Greek is a word that means the called out assembly. That's what the church is. It's an assembly, a gathering of people who have put their faith and trust in God. Now, David had to, now, I, I know this, I know this, that we live in the New Testament and that God's Spirit lives within us. God's Spirit lives within us, so he's in me, so wherever I go, God is with me, I understand that. But all of that Old Testament tabernacle and the temple, and that's where they believe the presence of God, that was all foreshadowing that in the New Testament, there would be a thing called the church. It's all the way through the New Testament. And anytime you see or read about the church in the Bible, it's talking about the people who gather together for the purpose of worshiping God and being in the presence of God. There should be a longing and a desire in your heart each and every week to be here. I look at the Dodger game. There's 50,000 people at the Dodger game, 50,000. This year, they had 2.8 million people go to a Dodger game. And that's okay. I, I, I have no issues if you want to go to a Dodger game. Last weekend, the Raiders played the Chargers. There were 60,000 people there. I saw lots of people posting pictures. They were at the football game, but they don't come to church. It's okay. I have no qualm with you going to a football game, basketball game, wherever you want to go. But the reason people go to those sporting events is because that's the longing of their heart, you see. And as Christians, if you're a believer, you should have a longing to be in the house of God. The airports are jammed. The sports arenas in this country right now are jammed. The grocery stores are full of people. Coffee shops are full of people. The casinos are wall-to-wall -wall people. Even the weed shops are probably full of people in California. <laughs> but the houses of God all across this country are empty today. Why are all the sporting events full and the churches of God are empty today? Just a couple of weeks ago was the Ryder Cup. It's a golf tournament. 
a golf tournament. The Americans versus the Europeans. I watched some of it. It was good stuff. There were 40,000 people there up in Wisconsin. These people got in line at 3 o'clock in the morning, 4 o'clock in the morning, and like before the sun even came up, they opened the doors. And these are grown adults. Started running just so they could get a seat and sit there for about five hours. I, I, there, I have a video. It's like 10 seconds long. This is legit footage of what took place. How many, how many from Wisconsin? These are your people. Watch this. And then, kind of like when Disney opens, they drop the rope at 6 a.m. If it wasn't running with the Bulls, it was running with the Holsteins. Now, how many of you think that's a little fanatical? You know, and again, I don't care about that. That's fine. But if people do that for a golf tournament in Wisconsin, don't you think people ought to show up to church on time? I, I was sitting over outside Jamba Juice. This guy, he gets out of his car, gets out of his car, and he, he's running into Jamba Juice, and he sees me, and he goes, hey, pastor. I go, how are you doing? Good. Where are you going? Jamba Juice. Oh, great. He, get, he says to me, is the church open yet? This is like two weeks ago. I looked at the guy. I thought he was like pulling my leg at first, but he's dead serious. Is the church open? I go, We've been open for a year and a half. How do, you, how do you know that Jamba Juice is open? But you don't know that the church is open? That there's only one thing there. There's just no hunger. There's no desire to be in the house of God for that brother. Now... So many times I come in here church and we worship and you can just feel the presence of God in this room. Stay with, stay with me. I walk out here and I preach and it's like, it's like electric in here, especially the 11 o'clock service. It's true. And there are many times where I, I just, I walk in here like, like, and the, 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 don't you see, this is the genius of God, that, that we would tune out the things of this world. I, put, put, up this verse, put up this verse one more time. David said, now remember, he's being pursued by his enemies. He said, there's one thing I ask, there's only one thing I seek, that I could somehow just live in the presence of God and in the house of God all the days of my life, to gaze upon his beauty. Because when you look, when you look, when you look and gaze upon God, Everything in this world, everything in this world that you worry about, you, you tend to start forgetting about those things because all you can see is God and being in the present. Nothing else seems, nothing seems to bother you. And so that's, that was the genius of God that we would that we would, that one day a week, that we would forget about all the stuff that's going on in the world and that we would gather together like this for the purpose of worshiping him. And somehow it, it recalibrates everything in our life. Do you understand that? And so many times I, I come to church and I walk in here and I just feel, I just, it's like, I, I got goosebumps right now. I, I just feel the presence of God in here. And then I'll walk off the stage and I'll, 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 I'll cry. You can ask my wife. She's sitting down here. Sometimes I walk off this stage and I just start crying because it's like God lets me be a small part of what he's doing and I can just, he was here today. 
and then I get on my phone and I get a text or an email from somebody who didn't like something today. Someone sitting at home in front of their computer. They don't even go to this church. They're not even involved in our church. Sometimes they live somewhere else. And it's like, this is, this is what you think church is? That you're, you watch? You, you, you're not even involved? You're all by yourself in a little room and you're watching and there's something you don't like? Something I say? Something I wear? Something that you disagree with? And so you wanna sit down and write a letter about what you don't like? This is what you think church is? You don't understand that I am here today, that you are here today, that God is here today, and we walked in here today to worship him, to glorify him, to hear from him. <laughs> to give something that represents our heart, to serve, to help the lost, to commune and take sacred, holy communion, and then to open up these sacred scriptures and to hear a word from Almighty God who sustains you, who keeps your heart beating, and he's here, you're here, I'm here, God's here. I got goosebumps only to walk off the stage and get a text from you about something you didn't like. What is that? <laughs> David was consumed just to be in the presence of God. Oh, I'm way over time. <laughs> look at this, look at this, uh, look, look what this pastor wrote. This came, from the, this came from the 1600s. We don't talk like this anymore. He said, why are not our hearts continually set on heaven? Why dwell we not there in constant contemplation? Bend thy soul to study eternity. Busy thyself about the life to come. Habituate thyself to such contemplations and let not those thoughts be seldom in hasty, but bathe thyself in heaven's delight. That's what we should be doing. Number three, quickly, 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 David celebrated unto the Lord. This is after you place your confidence and trust in God, and after you purposefully desire and long and dwell in the presence of God, you then cannot help but sing and worship and praise and celebrate. He says in verse six, this is the same chapter, he says then, everybody say then. He said, my head will be exalted above. In other words, after, after I put my confidence in God and trust in God, and after I, I'm in his presence, and this is where I'm content to dwell all the days of my life, then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me at his tabernacle. Will I sacrifice with shouts of joy, and I will sing, and I will make music unto the Lord. And the key word is the word then. The word then. This reminds me of that phrase that joy comes in the morning. That even though now I'm in the midst of the trial, being attacked, fearful things, frightening things all around me, I choose to dwell in the house of God, in the presence of God, and I'm just going to stay here and remain and establish and marry and settle in and if I just stay right here in the presence of God, then I understand that there's nothing that my enemies can do to defeat me. So we might as well sing and might as well dance and might as well celebrate. I've got to wrap this sermon up. Look at verse 27, Psalm 27, verse 14. Go to the very last verse of this psalm as we close. He says, what you need to do is just wait for who? For the Lord. 
Be strong and take heart and just wait. Just say wait. Wait. And write this down. Here's the key word. The key word is wait. The problem is we're all impatient. We pray. We want God to give us instant solutions. We want instant freedom from our problems. We want instant peace from our storms and from our trials. We don't wait on God. I heard about this guy. He was walking down a road and came to a, a junction. He didn't know which way to go. And there was a wise man sitting right there. And he said to the wise man, which, which road to success? And the wise man, he didn't say anything. He just pointed and he, went, he, he motioned. He just went. So the guy goes down that road. And just a little while, you hear this big splat. Splat! And he comes back. He'd been run over or something. And he says to the wise man, he said, hey, I asked you a question. Which road do I take to success? I went down that road like splat. I'm, I'm asking you which road for success. The, old, the wise man, he says nothing. He just points that way. So he goes, okay. So he goes down the exact same road again. Splat! And this time he comes back. He's bleeding. He's bruised. He's broken. And he says to the wise man, he said, I, I asked you which road to success. You sent me down here, I got splat. I went again, I splat. You gotta tell, hey, hey no, no more of this pointing stuff. I want you to talk, mister. You talk to me. What, tell me which road to success. And the wise man, he points this way. He doesn't say anything. He says, I want you to talk. And the wise man says, right past splat. And what he was saying is, that's the road. You're going to go through some hard times. Don't quit and don't run back here. Just keep going and you'll eventually be successful. And the Bible says these words in Galatians 6, 9. Let us not become weary in doing good. Let, let us not become weary in doing that which is right. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. And what happens, what happens is we go down the road that we think we're supposed to be on and we get splatted on and we quit or we turn back. It's too hard. We start to blame God. We turn our backs on God. We start to question God. We start to doubt God the first time we have trials. And I've seen it in the church. I've seen it. You come to church, get your feelings hurt, you write the letter, and you quit. So you go down the road to another church. And I know for a fact when someone quits this church, for whatever reason, and they go to another church. I know it's just a matter of time before they get their feelings hurt at that church and they quit that church and then they're going to go to another church. They're going to quit that church. They're going to go to another church. They're going to quit that church and eventually they end up right back here at this church. You're like a tree. We're trying to we're trying to grow you and mature you, so we plant you. We're trying to get your roots to go down, and you get upset and you quit, quit. so you go over here. It's like planting a tree, then you uproot it, and plant it here, and uproot it, and plant it there, and uproot it, and plant it there, and uproot it. You're a tree that will never flourish, will never experience all that God has for you because you're always getting your feelings hurt and doing, go, moving on down the road. And I will tell you this for a fact. Bethany, are you listening to me? <laughs> if you come to this church, you're going to get your feelings hurt. Right. It's not possible. You should try it. Come up and preach one sermon to 10,000 people and see if you can give a talk to really point people to Christ and away from sin and see if you can get by without hurting someone's feelings. It's not possible. <laughs> the 
David knew that this frightening situation was not necessarily going to go away, but in the midst of that trial, he was going to stay focused with his gaze on the Lord. He knew that. I want you to stand. Honey, can I tell one more story? Okay. So if you're upset, you're upset with her. <laughs> Cyrus was the king of Persia. And one time in the midst of battle, his army captured a prince and his family. And they brought the prince before King Cyrus. And the king looked at this prince and he said, what will you do if I decide to release you? And he said, the prince said, I'll give you half of all my wealth. And Cyrus looked at the man and said, what will you give me if I release your children? The prince said, I'll give you all of my wealth if you release my children. And then he said, what will you give if I release your wife? And the prince said, I will give you my life. And Cyrus was so moved by the devotion of this man, he released all of them. And on their journey home, listen carefully, they talked about all kinds of things. But one of the things that the prince asked his wife, <clears throat> he said, wasn't the king, wasn't Cyrus a handsome man? And his wife said, I didn't even notice because I couldn't take my eyes off of you the one who was willing to lay down his life for me. Now listen carefully. Each of us has what's called a gaze, G-A-Z-E, detection within us. What is a gaze detection? It means that when you walk into a room, you can tell if someone's staring at you. That's an innate ability that God put within us. You just walk in the room. You can tell. You just get this vibe that someone's staring at you. You know who put that detection in you? God did. Do you know where it came from? It came from God because God has that same detection. He knows whether or not we're gazing upon him. And what happens in our world today, we've got our gaze on athletes and movie stars and social media influencers and the talking heads on television. I just want to tell you this. I'm done preaching. All those talking heads on the news channels, not one of them, not one of them have ever laid down their life for your eternity. All the athletes in this country, and I, I, there's some I root for, but not one of them have ever laid down their life for your eternity. All the movie stars and actors and actresses in this city have never laid down their life for you. Not a single comedian in this city has ever laid down their life for you. The only person who's ever laid their life down for your eternity is when Jesus Christ went to the cross. And what he wants, and this was again his genius, is that we would, once a week, we'd get, forget about every movie star and actor and actress and singer and athlete and talking head, get all that and come to the house of God and worship God, study his word, and just dwell in his presence. And everything again in this world will be better off for you if you could get your gaze on God where it belongs. Let's pray. Let's pray. God, thank you for today. Thank you for this church. Thank you for this series. Oh, there's a baptistry over here to my left. If anyone here 
needs to be baptized or become a member or accept Christ, just help them go over there and go through those doors. But Lord, I pray your blessing on every man, woman, boy, and girl here. I know we're not supposed to stay inside this building, that, that you do call us to get out of, out of this building. But Lord, I pray that you would give us a longing to be here and to dwell in your presence wherever we go, and certainly to take one day a week and come to the house of the Lord, as you've established in your word for each of us. Pray your blessing. Bring us back safely next week, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you, and thank you for coming today.